what? Well, it, it, it depends on what you're making. It tells you all the ingredients. Uh, maybe you're making a casserole. It'll tell you how to put it together. It'll tell you what to set the temperature at. It, it'll tell you how long to put it in the oven. It has everything already figured out. So if you were a cook, you want to use this recipe or cookbook. Let me say, I just had a couple here on the day. Let's say we're going to make meatloaf. Okay, it says we need two pounds of ground meat. Here's the way it's Okay, it has three eggs. It has minced onions. It has um, breadcrumbs, or you can or, uh, flavor with breadcrumbs, a cup, uh, salt and pepper. Let's say you want to make the meatloaf and you forget to put in the three <laughs> eggs. What do you think might happen? It won't stay together. The eggs are kind of like glue in that way. It's not glue, but it's kind of like holds the loaf together when you form it in the loaf. That, the eggs would, wouldn't be in it, so it might, it might fall apart when you get a cut of the plant or Okay? Uh, this is you're making dessert chocolate chip cookies. Anybody like chocolate chip cookies? Yeah. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites, yeah. Okay, that's chocolate chip cookies. It said, I'll just read some of them. You need flour, you need baking soda, you need butter, short beans, a cup of brown sugar, a half a cup of white sugar, two eggs, vanilla, okay? Chocolate, a bag of chocolate chip, a uh, 12 ounce bag. Um, now, let's say you make chocolate chip cookies, cookies and you will forget to add the a uh, cup of brown sugar. How do you get my cake? That makes it sweet, right? So it might be sour, bitter, I don't know. But it might be gross. So then you just ruin the whole batch and you ruin all those ingredients so you can like add one. Then it goes in the oven and says for eight minutes it's 350 degrees. But if you follow this out, right, uh, there are your directions or your instructions and through the taste stuff. Okay, so this book is what a or a chef might use. Now, if you're a Christian, what's this? Bible. Bible, this is what you use if you want your life to turn out right. Uh, what a Christian is, a Christian is somebody who believes that Jesus is God's Son and is our Savior. Other beliefs believe that Jesus was just a good teacher and died and finished by them believe he's God's Son. We believe he's God's Son and he is our Savior. That makes you a Christian. So we want to follow this Bible. This Bible was completely written about 2,000 years ago. But you know that every case that you can think of, you can find scripture pertaining to um, the problem you might have. So, I just want to share a couple. Let's, this is kind of like, you know, you're going to use this as a booklet, or you're going to use this for instruction for a Christian. Um, let's say you sin. When you sin, it means you were one of God's commandments. And you did wrong. You feel really bad about that. Like, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. Well, like, where, what do you read whenever you sin? Well, David, David was a great man of God. From a little boy, he was the one that he was a shepherd and he fought the lions and he became king. But he had a bad sin in there somewhere. He was married and Bathsheba was married, but him and Bathsheba had a baby together. So that's called adultery because they were both married to somebody else. That's a sin. And then he had Bathsheba's husband was killed, had murdered. He committed two very serious, um, you know, sins. So he wrote Psalm 51. So when you sin and you do something you shouldn't have and you want, you know, peace of mind, and this is some of the words that David wrote. Be, be merciful to me, O God, because of your constant love, because of your great mercy, wipe away my sins. Wash away all my evil and make me clean from my sins. I recognize my fault. I have sinned against you, only against you. Remove my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Now there's lots more, but that's just a couple of verses out of that. So maybe it's, it's a comforting. If you sin, help with something you can read about that. There's lots more, but that's just one of them. Uh, let's say you worry. You might have a test coming up in school. The school comes and you worry about this test at all. No, I hope I don't fail. Or maybe you worry that your grandparent or somebody is sick or his brother or something sick and you worry. Well, Jesus taught us in um, Matthew chapter 6 about not to worry. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. He said, just think of the birds. Okay, the birds in here. Birds don't gather food together. They don't have no refrigerators, freezers. They don't have no pantries with food stored up. They have to just get food for the day. And God provides for them. And he said, just think how much more he loves you than, than the animals. He's going to provide for you. 
Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about your food or your or your water. Another one is, let's say somebody did you wrong, and they said, please forgive me. And what they did was bad, and it's hard to forgive someone. Well, Jesus also said in Matthew um, chapter 6, he said about forgiving others, he said, if you don't forgive others what they did, my Father in Heaven will not forgive you. But if you do forgive other people, then when you sin, God will forgive you. So it's like a two-way street. You have to forgive others if you want to be forgiven. So that's what we told us in Matthew chapter 6. Also, let's say you're lonely or you're fearful, or you're afraid, maybe the door or you're, you know, you have to go somewhere where you're, you're just scared of your lonely. Well, David wrote another psalm, Psalm 23. David was a great shepherd um, watching his sheep. And many times we're referred to as we're the sheep and God is the shepherd. The shepherd is my God's children. Well, in Psalm 23, uh, uh, David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What's that mean? Well, it means uh, the Lord watches over me. I have everything I need, is what he's saying there. He gives, and he says, he needs me to the water, he needs me to the grass. There's another verse in verse 4, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's saying that even though you were in that dark, scary place, remember God with you, and you still watch over you. So, use this to grow as a Christian. There's a scripture that I love, it's, it's in Psalm, it says, Know the scripture by heart, and keep it from sinning. So we need to know our scripture. So when we have problems come up, we can say that's wrong and that's what we're going to say then. We love you more. He, right. He, he created you like from his own enemy. And he loves animals, but he loves you even more. So if he's taking care of the animals each day, he's going to take care of you. So remember, if you are trying to be a Christian, follow this book. And if you're going to try to make a meal for somebody, follow this book. If you want it to turn out right, this will help your life turn out right. Let's bow our heads for prayer. So we thank you for the children that came forward. And we ask that you to be with them and help them to grow as Christians and they will do the things that are right and pleasing to you and bless those that have brought them today. And do with us all. In Jesus' precious name.
Heavenly Father, we come to uh, worship once again knowing that there is an answer to the pandemic, there's an answer to the violence in our world, and there's an answer to the restlessness that we find in our lives. And we find that answer at the foot of the cross. A cross that we know is empty because you've conquered sin and death just as you have promised. You've gone before us and prepared a place for us in heaven for when our work here is done. So we come with grateful hearts knowing that we can trust you. Your word reminds us that you hear every prayer that we pray. You know the deepest desires of our hearts. And part of our heart's desire today is that you continue to teach us how to live in prayer. How we can be used to helping to build your kingdom. Part of our heart's desire is that you bring healing to all those who are on our prayer list. We're thankful for those who have been able to go home from the hospital. For those this week who have been healed, some physically, others mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. We've noticed how our prayer list has changed, how we're able to take some names off because you met that need. Yet still part of our heart's desire is that you bring that same kind of healing to our beloved denomination where we know we are two pretending that we're one. We have those who are not living according to the truth of your word. We have some who want to be politically correct. We have others who are trying to please men and women instead of speaking and preaching the loving and forgiving truth of your word. Our prayer is that you would continue to find us faithful to your word. We know that it is getting harder and harder to do that, even in our country. We hear some of our leaders say that right is wrong and wrong is right. So help us that the foundation of all that we say and do will be based on your word. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus and remember that he is ultimately in control and that we have so many things to be thankful for. So many things that we, uh, unlike so many in the world, don't have. There are those things that we just take for granted every day and don't even miss them until they're gone. Things like our freedoms, especially the freedom we have to worship here this morning. The fact that we have water that runs hot and cold, we can't imagine anyone not having good, clean water today. But we know that there are many in the world that don't have any or very little at all. We can't imagine not having food to eat, but there are those even close to where we are living here who are going to go hungry today. And they go hungry while we decide what we're going to eat or where we're going to eat. We can't imagine what it's like to have no place to call home where we are loved and cared for, where we have the comforts of electricity in our pillow and our bed. We can't imagine not having our cell phones and computers where our cars or our trucks or our garages where so many can't get the vehicles in because of all the stuff that's in there. And we have no idea what it's like to carry with you throughout the day <clears throat> everything that you own. So we ask that you would forgive us for all of the things that we have and take for granted. Forgive us for the times we take you for granted as well. Help us to put our trust in you every day. And help us that we might continue to learn how to pray through the model that you gave so long ago. You said when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson, as you see, is from the 25th chapter of Psalm. Would you read the lesson with me, please? In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let mine enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. 
for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from the old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. This is the word of God today for the people of God. Thanks be to God, and may it become alive in all of us today. As we know, there are a lot of people not living in peace today. And they're not living in peace like you and I are because we have put our trust in God where they have not. I read the story of a man who boarded an airplane and the pilot was standing there in the cockpit and called him out by name and he looked up and noticed that it was a man that he knew really well. He said, I knew he was a seasoned pilot. He flew transports in Vietnam. He has logged a book full of commercial flights. He probably has faced every crisis that you can think of from electrical storms to running out of gas. He's not only a good pilot, but he's a good man. We chatted for a moment, and he said, I went and took my seat with the assurance that I knew I was in good hands. And that came in handy because about an hour later, we hit this uh, wall of wind, and everything in the plane was shaking. The uh, flight attendant said, make sure your seatbelt's fashioned because we're in for a ride. And that fact, it was a ride uh, rougher than some roller coasters that I had been on. But as I looked around, he said, I know this, that compared to the other uh, people on the plane, I was much calmer. Didn't have a death wish, but I had an advantage. And my advantage was I knew the pilot, and I trusted him, and I trusted his heart. I said to myself, you know, he can handle anything. The storm is bad but he's good. So much so that I was able to relax as much as you can in that kind of a situation. As you and I know, we are living in a stormy world. Every day we seem to face a different <clears throat> turbulence. It's the uncertain economy or it's the declining job market. It's something that's going on with the virus or it's the violence and death we hear about on our streets. Or it's just our aging bodies that aren't what they used to be. <clears throat> the question during this time is only one. Do you trust the pilot that you have placed your life in? You see, unfortunately, there are many today finding that the pilot that they place their life in is failing them. The resounding response of the Bible tells us that we can trust our pilot who is God. The psalmist said, you are good. You are good and upright. Jeremiah tells us in the 29th chapter, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Our God who brought chaos <clears throat> out of, uh, brought order out of chaos and who created creation with the word called Adam out of dust and Eve out of the bone. Isaiah tells us, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. The writer of Hebrews says, he sustains everything by the mighty power of his command. He loves and forgives us and he strengthens us. <clears throat> in fact, his goodness is a major theme in the Bible. The psalmist said, <clears throat> taste and see that the Lord is good. He's at one time our Father <clears throat> and our Creator. He's holy high above us, but He still hears every prayer <clears throat> that we pray, and He answers it according to His will. I read about <clears throat> a 15-year-old boy who had just inherited his brother's Rambler station wagon. Some of you will remember what a Rambler station wagon looked like. He said, I got it because my brother was going off to college and he got a used limit as a graduation gift. 
if you would look up the word jalopy in the dictionary, he said, you might see a picture of my rambler. It's faded uh, paint, standard shift on the column, if you remember that, and had a worn interior. Didn't look like much, but it was mine. My dad handed me the keys and he said, you have to keep gas in the gas tank. I said, okay. Have to keep it washed? No problem. Got to change the oil? Okay. Can you do that? Absolutely. To be told, to be true, I didn't know much about cars at all. And that was odd because my dad was a mechanic. He tried to teach me about cars, but I just didn't seem to listen or learn much. But it wasn't very long until the oil needed changed. And Dad asked, you know how to do it? Yes, sir. You want any help? Now I can handle it. I should have said yes. An hour or so later, after finding the oil pan and draining the oil, I forgot to put the plug back in before I poured the new oil in the engine. My dad came out and he said, all done? I said, yep, all done. He pointed to the driveway and he said, well, what's all that oil running down there? He looked at me and he said, you know, son, we need to talk. The amazing thing wasn't that. He didn't get angry. But he showed me, he taught me actually step by step how to change the oil in the car. And I have never spilled oil since that lesson. We need to remember that as we face the, the toughest challenges of our life, they're simply an oil change to God. We make unnecessary messes with our life because we don't talk to Him and we don't listen to the lessons that He's trying to teach us. So before we face the world, we need to face our Father. And one more story. This one is from the book Jesus Called and He Wants His Church Back. The author says a few years ago, because of some amazing connections, I received an invitation to meet with the President of the United States in the Oval Office. I was thrilled. But the protocol was unbelievable. They sent one letter after another. They called me on the phone. The Secret Service showed up at my door. And when they were all done, I, I asked them what I should wear. And they said, well, wear what you normally wear. And my wife said, there is no way you're going to wear that. You have to buy a new suit. So I bought a new suit. I made my airline reservations. I flew across the country. I checked into the nearest hotel to the White House the night before that I could get. I found out that my friend had also been invited. To, he was at a different hotel, but he said, let's meet tomorrow at the front gate at 7.30 sharp. Don't forget to bring your ID, and remember that this is going to take a while. I was excited. He said I couldn't sleep. I closed the heavy drapes on the windows to make it as dark as I could. I set my alarm on my iPhone for 6 a.m. so I would have plenty of time. And then I started calling everybody that I knew. I'm going to meet the President of the United States in the Oval Office tomorrow. Can you imagine that? Well, the next morning, my room, pitch black, found that the phone, hotel phone, was ringing. I picked it up and my friend said, where are you? You're supposed to be here. And I said, wait a minute. My phone didn't even go off yet and I set my phone for 6 o'clock. Well, you need to look at it because it's already 7.35. I looked at my phone, and my phone was dead. I said, give me 10 minutes, I'll be there. 10 minutes. And he said, I'm sorry, it's too late. They're right here right now, ready to take us in. So it slowly dawned on me, so I just slept through the, the only chance that I would have to meet the President of the United States in the Oval Office. And then he writes, let me tell you two things about this story. Number one, it's not true. I have never received an invitation to meet with the President of the United States. But number two, the same scenario happens to Christians like you and me all the time. 
for every day, every morning. We have the opportunity to meet with somebody far more important than the President of the United States. We can meet and have conversation with the God of the universe. He invites us to get up and to read His Word and to pray and to connect with Him as we start our day. But if we're honest, we start a lot of our days as we've overslept. And then we're so busy that we don't have time to, to talk with Him. Or we just don't want to. He seems distant at times. And, and there are those times that we're disconnected and dissatisfied and we're discouraged and we're joyous. The God of the universe longs to be close to us. To talk with us. To share with us good news. To teach us how to live in peace even in the midst of all that we're facing today. The truth is, you and I are as close to God as we want to be. From my first story, the man on the plane, he says the pilot got us through the storm. He stood at the cockpit door as we exited. I said, it got a little choppy out there, didn't it? And he asked, were you scared? <clears throat> and I thought for a moment, I said, you know, not really. Everything changes when you know the pilot. And I knew my pilot was up to the task today. From that second story in the used car and the oil change, have you met with your Heavenly Father today so that He could teach you how to live in peace? And from the third, how close are you to God? How much time have you spent with Him recently? Again, before you face the world, make sure you face your problem. And then with the psalmist say, You, Lord, are my God. In you I put my trust. I trust in you. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. For Lord, you are good and upright. Let's pray. Father, our prayer is that you would help us never to forget that. That you are good. And you are our friend. And everything changes when we spend time with you. No matter if we're on the mountain top or in the valley. We thank you for always being there. And for knowing that we can always trust you.